A couple weeks ago, Chinese and Russian officials announced at a joint session in St. Petersburg the creation of the International Lunar Research Station, a proposal for space cooperation with the goal of putting a station at the South Pole of the Moon sometime in the 2030s. China has been doing great stuff in space recently, with its Tianwen-1 Mars mission and the Zhurong lander, the Tianhe core module and the Shenzhou-12 launch of crew to the Tiangong space station, and the Chang'e-5 mission. They've been doing great stuff and their private sector, as private as you can call it, has also been doing great work, leading the way in reusability, following the paths of Western companies like SpaceX. Now, this success by the Chinese space program has drawn a lot of attention from most notably Bill Nelson, who's been using it as a point to try to get more funding for NASA's own Artemis program, saying that there's a second space race to the moon. In today's video, I'm going to say why I don't think there really is a second space race, but why it's important to not discount China's efforts in space, and also Russia and other international partners who are vital to NASA's effort in space, and give the US space program much needed legitimacy and stability in an often tumultuous political environment. Now let's get into the actual proposal of the space station itself. It comes in several phases, the first of which is the reconnaissance phase. Its objectives are lunar reconnaissance, initial design and selection of sites, and verification of technologies for high precision soft landings. The first phase includes Chang'e 4, Russia's planned Luna 25 and Luna 26 missions to the moon, the Chang'e 6 and Chang'e 7 missions in 2024, and Russia's Luna 27 in August of 2025. These missions are going to give both Russia and China vital experience in operations in the lunar South Pole region which, due to the relatively recent discovery of vast deposits of water ice there, means it's a prime target for human exploration and sustained colonization. This program mirrors NASA's CLPS, or Commercial Lunar Payload Systems Contract Program, which is also going to fund tons of missions to the Lunar South Pole, although its first flight of the Peregrine Astrobotics Lander has been delayed to 2022 on the Vulcan rocket. Phase 2 of the IRLS plan is termed construction. It's due to last from 2026 to 2035. The construction phase is going to begin with the Chang'e 8 and Luna 28 mission, which is planned to receive sample return missions from the Lunar South Pole. It's also going to construct experiments and test technologies necessary to the construction of a lunar science base. Then begins the in earnest construction of the actual research station, with five missions, IRLS 1, 2, 3, and 4, planned to launch in 2031, 2032, 2033, 2034, and 2035 respectively, all launching on Long March 9 or Yenisei rockets. Now, very recently, in the past couple days, China's revised the design of their Long March 9 rocket in order to maybe facilitate better reusability and possibly even facilitate a quicker time to its first flight. But to be honest, the Long March 9 design is changing pretty frequently at this point, and it's pretty far off. So combine a mostly paper rocket design with China's notoriously opaque space industry, you really don't know what's going to be happening in the next two years, never mind the next ten. But in 2035, they're going to transition to the utilization phase, beginning in 2036, whose objectives include lunar research, exploration, and technology verification, supporting crewed lunar missions, and expanding and maintaining modules as needed. Now, in a similar function to the Artemis Accords, Roscosmos and the CNSA have also announced that they are in early talks with ESA, the CNES of France, and Thailand, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE as potential partners for the International Lunar Research Station. This is important because it essentially creates two opposing camps in the space field, this is because the US is never going to cooperate with China in space, at least not in the foreseeable future, thanks to the Wolf Amendment, which effectively bars any cooperation with the Chinese space program. With ESA also looking into cooperating with China on their new Tiangong space station, running scientific experiments, and maybe even sending astronauts, you really have to think if the US is going to force countries to choose a side between the Artemis Accords and the ILRS. But the Artemis program has got one strong thing going for it. It's going to be happening 12 years before the earliest Chinese or Russian missions. And that's the problem. China is way behind the US in space, especially in deep space operations. 
Don't get me wrong, it's very impressive, but there is no substitute for the culture of innovation that the US has encouraged through decades of private enterprise and also just the institutional talent that's accumulated at NASA and its private contractors. So when Bill Nelson says we're in a race back to the moon, it's not really an accurate statement. I mean, not to mention the fact we've done this in 1969, there's also a huge lead that the US has today. And despite all the drama over SLS and HLS, I mean, we're finally seeing the SLS rocket being stacked, SpaceX has just stacked the booster number three, and, you know, there's just a sense of real optimism, I think, among the space community. Even though there's a little lull in Starship development, it really feels like we're finally seeing progress on tons of projects that have just been in development hell for the 2010s. And now that we're in the 2020s, there's... I think a real sense of optimism for a lot of space fans, I know at least for myself. And within the Chinese space program, you're also seeing a huge push towards space. Not necessarily deep space humanned missions, but the creation of satellite constellations, a permanent presence in low Earth orbit. We're seeing China take huge steps that are really admirable. Despite, of course, all the concerns you can have with their governance, it's undoubtedly some great things they're doing in the space field. I also want to say that the Chinese space ecosystem itself is actually a surprisingly vibrant field, and without podcasts like the Dong Fong Hour and Andrew Jones and Cosmic Penguin on Twitter, the Chinese space program would be much more opaque than it is today. I hope you guys all check them out. With that, I'm Cosplus Content, signing off.